All right, the last observation. Let's keep going. Here we go. This is Acts chapter 16. We're going to finish reading it. So they get arrested. They're in jail. They're singing around midnight. Then there's this earthquake. The prison bars kind of break open. Let's see what happens. Let's back up all the way to verse 25 because it's kind of good to set the stage. And then let's see what their spirit is as the story unfolds. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once, all the prison doors flew open and everybody's chains came loose. The jailer woke up and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself. Now, why was he going to do that? The officials, I mean, you were tasked with keeping those prisoners in place. And if the prisoners were gone, it's not like today where maybe they'd put you on trial. Maybe you'd spend a little time in jail. You got executed on the spot. It's a very unforgiving society. So he's about to kill himself because he thought, of course, the doors are open. Uh, now, and we could talk about this for hours, because if I'm one of the other prisoners in there and the bars break open, what do you think I'm going to do? I'm out of here. Why they all stayed, there had to be something that Paul and Silas were doing, the way they were singing, the way that they were talking to him. They wanted to keep hearing what was being said. But Paul said, don't harm yourself. We are all here. The jailer calls for lights, rushes in, falls trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and said, sir, what must I do to be saved? They replied, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. They spoke the word of the Lord to him and all the others in his house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds, and immediately uh, he and all of his family were baptized. The jailer brought them into his house, set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole family. Wow, uh, what an exciting moment. So here these guys are. They still got wounds. They're still in prison. But they are all about the mission because this question comes up. And I put it like this. In ministry, there is no better question that you want to hear than this. What must I do to be saved? You know, I, I love explaining that to people. I love seeing it when it happens. You know, we don't give altar calls here. I'm not a big fan of altar calls. It's just a personal thing for me because I grew up in a church with altar calls and they drove me crazy. Uh, uh, because I saw people walk up the aisle and they accepted Jesus Christ as their personal Savior and they were no different afterwards. I'm a believer in when you accept Jesus Christ, your personal Savior can be here, it can be online, it can be at your house. It's that moment when you actually understand that you are lost without the free gift of salvation. Um, but I still enjoy talking to people about it. One of my favorite things about Vacation Bible School is Uncle Jay uh, always gives the pure plan of salvation. And then he does a thing where kids are going down, maybe going to crafts or going to the gym. And he says, if anybody wants to talk a little bit more about Jesus or come to know him personally, uh, I'll be waiting up here, come and talk to me. And inevitably every year there's kids going up the front to talk to him. What are they doing? They're literally saying, what must I do to be saved? That's why we're here to get people to ask that question, to be able to tell them the story of Jesus and the things that he has done. And so when the opportunities arise, we got to talk about it. We're going to talk about it several times this month. We talked about it this morning. We're going to talk about it at the candlelight. We're going to talk about it on Christmas Sunday morning because we want everybody answering that question, what must I do to be saved? And when they answer and they believe we should get excited about it because the Bible makes it clear it is not a non-emotional moment. It is okay to get excited. Let's look what they say in Luke chapter 15 and verse 7. Another reminder that even, you know, kind of we're, we fall into the conservative church category, obviously. Uh, <clears throat> but it's okay to get a little excited. I kid all the time. We got it. Maybe occasionally we should have a couple charismatic folks come to visit and let them fire us up just a little bit. Okay. Here we go. 15, verse 7. I tell you that in the same way, there will be mild excitement in heaven 
over one sinner who repents. There will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents. Now, we don't know what all is going on, but I just imagine information coming in. Hey, at Salem Bible Church, three people accepted Christ as their personal Savior, and the heavens rejoice, and people are excited. I mean, we get glimpses of it. Remember the, the one I'm talking about when the angels appear to tell the shepherds the story, and then all of a sudden the heavens burst, burst forth, glory to God in the highest? Angels who are in the presence of the king are still excited about it. And we get numbed by life sometimes, but it is okay for us to get excited about this stuff. When kids come forward and they want to know about Christ as their Savior, you need to get excited about it. When you hear me giving the invitation, be praying that somebody here or online is responding to it. Because <clears throat> God is still at work, and so we, we should be excited about it. When we have visitors come through the door of the church, we should be thrilled that people are coming in, wanting to hear what's going on, wants, wants to hear the message. And so uh, I'm sure Paul and Silas felt the same way about that question. So let's go back to Acts. The answer to the question, of course, is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Now, the interesting part, <laughs> I always find it interesting that people want to spend a lot of time thinking about things that doesn't even pop into my mind. So some commentaries were questioning whether or not the jailer was actually saved. Because some speculate, he, when he said, what must I do to be saved, he was talking about being saved from the hatchet or the sword that was coming uh, towards him and not really interested in salvation. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you read the whole story, it seems pretty clear to me. Because the response that Paul gave didn't have anything to do with being saved from some physical occurrence. He goes right back to the heart of the matter. My guess is what was happening is Paul and Silas had been singing and talking about Jesus all night. The jailer had already been hearing it. At some point he goes to bed and they just keep on singing. He already had some information. And so he asked that question and then the response, nice and simple. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. It is just that simple. That's why it is that children can receive it. I received it at age seven. I can't remember almost nothing of ages four, five, six, and seven. Day or two in kindergarten, a couple things along there. But man, I could still remember that day. And I remember exactly what it was that I did. Because it wasn't complicated. Jesus died for you. Do you want that free gift of salvation? Now, sometimes the message has to be adjusted for the people that you're talking to. I don't remember my Sunday school teacher telling me in detail that I needed to repent of my sin. As a seven-year-old, it's not the kind of thing that's hitting you. What's hitting you is that free gift of salvation. As we get older and we understand <clears throat> all that is occurring in life, that's one of the things that we talk about. Because in order to receive that free gift, you have to realize that your sin is preventing you from entering into heaven. You need to turn from that and receive that free gift of salvation. But it is a simple answer. And you can tell here, he didn't say anything else except believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And they responded to it. So the question of was the jailer really saved, my answer is I think absolutely. Now what am I basing that on? It was about something that Jesus explained in Matthew chapter 7. Let's remind ourselves. You'll hear me talk about this, especially when I'm talking a little bit about salvation, because I do think there are people that have spent time in church. Maybe they've heard that altar call, you know, accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, say this sinner's prayer. And so they went through the motions. You've probably met people like that, that mouth the words, uh, but nothing really occurred because once we accept Jesus Christ, our personal Savior, his spirit comes and lives, lives inside of us and he's trying to help us grow. And in that process, we change or as the scripture says, we begin to produce fruit. And in Matthew chapter seven and verse 16, Jesus is talking about that. He's trying to warn about false prophets, but telling us this fact about life. Watch out for the false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit, you will recognize them. And then he goes on. Man, you can see grapes from one, 
uh, thorn thistles from another. False prophet, prophets produce a certain fruit. Followers of Jesus Christ produce a fruit. So that's how we know. We look at one another and say, is there any difference from when you made that profession of faith to the person that you are now? Is there some growth? By their fruit, you will recognize them. So if we go back to our story and we look at this idea, let's see if in this instant there was any difference in this jailer. Let's go back to Acts chapter 16 and see some things that we notice in there. So verse 31, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be saved. This applies to you, your entire household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and all the others in the house. And they starts going to a little detail. And knowing Paul, I'm sure he's given him all the information and all the facts that he needed. So what's the first thing that they, the jailer does? Immediately there's a difference in him. Because I'm tell, let me tell you something. In order to be a jailer in that day and age, how much compassion did you have to pack along with the job? None, right? You had one job and one job only. Keep those people locked in the farthest part of the jail. Make sure there's no escape. You can have no compassion on them. But immediately after this happens, what's the first thing that he wants to do? He takes them and washes their wounds. Immediately we see compassion. I think one of the first fruits that you should see in believers, a change of compassion, a gentleness to the world around them, maybe to their families, to the things that maybe they didn't have compassion about before. It, it's a part of the spirit at work within us. And you see it in him, in him immediately. The second thing you see is obedience. I'm sure Paul was telling them, if you really have made a decision about Jesus, in obedience, you have to get baptized. And what does he do right away? goes out and gets baptized. Uh, baptism was just a sign of saying, I have made this decision. I know who Jesus is. I've received that free gift, and I want everybody to know that I'm a believer. That's the reason we don't do infant baptisms in our church, because the, the practice in the New Testament was the baptism of adults who made a decision about God or about his son Jesus, and they got baptized as a way of saying, I'm on board. This is me. I'm a follower of him. And so we baptize those who've made that decision. So he's compassionate. He's obedient. And then there's something else <clears throat> that is a part of the, uh, the family of God. It says, verse 34, the jailer brought them into his house, set a meal before him, and he was filled with joy. Because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole family. So you see the whole thing. He's got compassion, he's got obedience, and he's rejoicing as a result of it. We can look at ourselves for the same thing. If you want to put a little test about how you're doing in your faith, do you have compassion on others? Do you want to see them know and understand the story of Jesus? You know, one of the things that you often hear me talk about our broken world is we should be moved by the horrible condition of of where they are. Right? I mean, the world is literally broken. The things that happen, the things that are going on in our public schools should leave us shocked. But instead of getting angry about it, we should have compassion because what they need is a relationship with Jesus Christ. So we should have compassion. We should have obedience. He tells us to seek first the kingdom of God. Are we interested in doing that? Or are we still seeking first our kingdom and, and the things that we want become more important than the things that he want? And do you find yourself in the midst of all this craziness still have joy? And I'll tell you, one of the things I love about coming here on Sundays is I love smiling and laughing together. When we were singing that verse about creeping up the steps and I'm looking over at Steve, I almost couldn't finish the song. Because <laughs> it's life. But I have joy because I know my name is written in the book of life. And so those are things that we can pass on to others. And if, if, if you are watching today and you're, or you're here tonight and you have no compassion, you're not interested in obeying him, and you're never filled with joy, you better ask yourself, did you really accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? Because Jesus said, by their fruit, you shall know them. You can look at your own fruit and say, what is different in me? Now, that doesn't mean perfection, Right? We still all struggle. I still, I still get frustrated at things. I lose my temper. I still get frustrated in traffic. You know, 
But I can say as time goes on, those things that used to bother me become farther in the rear view mirror because God is still working and molding and shaping me. And so he was doing the same thing here in the jailer. So uh, for me, it seems pretty clear uh, he's got to change life. And so I left this question out to the world. What does God see in you? Because that's really the question. And I think it's a question that has to be asked more often in our world today. Because I think there's a lot of people sitting in churches. I mentioned this morning about, well, I really thought that that production that Northridge put on was a top-notch, I said a 10 out of 10 quality production. Uh, the kind of thing I'd be proud to be a part of. And I thought they gave a very good explanation of salvation in Jesus Christ. But still... They have thousands upon thousands of people that are sitting in their churches each week that struggle with obedience, compassion, and what was the last one? Joy. Uh, and so in these churches, these mega churches, those questions should come up. Because you don't get saved by coming to our church, by going to Northridge, 242, Oak Point. All of them has nothing to do with salvation. It's you understanding who Jesus is and making a decision for him. And so we need to be asking that question, what does God see in you? Can you stand up and say, Jesus changed my life? I got one more bonus question, I mean bonus observation in this chapter. Let's finish up chapter 16. Bonus lesson number two. Mature believers are in the business of wanting to serve others. Now, before we read verse 40, let's kind of set the stage. So Paul and company have been attacked, arrested. People have been lying about them. They got beaten. They got put in jail. Stocks on their feet. Survived an earthquake. I don't know about you, but about that point, I might be looking over, because Steve and I were kidding about this earlier. I was watching the screen as it was going through, and I started looking at all the stuff we got going on in December. It's a busy month for us. So I looked over at Steve, I go, Maybe we should take January off. <laughs> Recharge month. Come back in February. I'd like to do that, but that's not how God set things up. It doesn't matter what you go through. We should be in the business of looking around us and saying, how can I help? So let's see what these guys do after they get out of prison. Let's keep reading Acts chapter 16. So here we go. After Paul and Silas came out of the prison... They went to Lydia's house where they met with the brothers and encouraged them. Then they left. What? What, what do you want? Let me read. I would be. Then Paul and Silas came out of the prison. They went to Lydia's house where they rested for a month. Let other people feed them. No. Mature believers are moving forward, looking for ways. How can I encourage the people around me? What can I do to pray for? How can I lift you up? How can I make you smile? How can I put a, uh, you know, a little smile on your face? What joke? What can I do to encourage you? That's what mature believers do. And this is an idea that is found in the scriptures. This isn't just an illustration of something. There's also commands about it that apply to us. Let's close up with this one. Let's go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. This idea, and this, this is found in a lot of places. There are people that have studies. You can find a study booklet on Amazon that's called The One Another Sayings in the Scripture about all the commands that we get for things that we are supposed to do for one another. We're going to look at a couple of them here. First in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 11. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up just as in fact you are doing. So here's a command. That's what we're supposed to be doing. How can we encourage you? What's going on in your life that, that you need help with? Sometimes you're just going through a rough patch and you just want to unburden yourself on somebody. So be a good listener. Sometimes it's just hanging out with somebody, maybe not saying anything, just being with them, calling them up and saying, let's go get something to eat. Uh, last week, my friend uh, Mike uh, needed to have a procedure done, uh, and he needed a driver because they were going to kind of put him into twilight and, and put some shots in his back. 
you know, my life is busy. I got a lot of things going on. And I had a lot of things to, to get done that day. So we get out of the procedure. I'm driving. He says, oh, and of course, Mike is like me. Mike enjoys a good meal. <laughs> and he hadn't been able to eat since 9 o'clock the night before. So we get out of this procedure. You know, the first thought in his mind, food. So he says, hey, hey, you want to go get breakfast? And I'm thinking, man, I got to get home. I got stuff I got to get done. But you could just tell. You just wanted to, you wanted to talk. You wanted to. I said, yeah, okay, let's go. So he took me to this restaurant in Brighton I'd never been to called Cheryl's. Anybody been to that? Uh, they just had breakfast and lunch. They closed to it. Man, that's tasty. That's some tasty food in there. Nothing's cheap anymore, though. Breakfast is getting crazy. So we spent more than an hour there, not because the food wasn't done, just he just wanted to talk about his life and what's going on. And I enjoyed the great breakfast, but my main goal is what can I do to encourage you? Sometimes it's just listening, just telling him he's on the right path. You know, he had a long, difficult road of, you know, alcohol and drug abuse to get him to the point where he is here. And I'm proud of him. He's five years sober. He's proud of it. But he's alone. He hates being alone. Uh, and so I do what I can to try to encourage people. You got to do the same thing. Maybe it's just like that, going out for breakfast and just listening to somebody. But this is not something that you maybe do. This is one of these commands. We're to be in the business of encouraging others.